continuité des, des trois dernières interventions sur le, le sujet du cloud et de l'interopérabilité, euh, nous entrons sur le deuxième panel qui est animé par euh, le Cloud Architect chez Canonical. Donc j'invite Nicolas Barset qui conseille euh, ses clients et ses partenaires dans la définition de leur stratégie cloud. Euh, il va inviter huit intervenants sur le panel. Euh, et la question est où en est le déploiement du cloud et a-t-il suffisamment progressé euh, pour permettre le déploiement de la fédération, d'une fédération cloud Merci. J'ai demandé aux différents participants du panel de, de venir, tous ensemble, hein, vous n'allez pas attendre que je vous présente. Donc, euh, nous avons la chance aujourd'hui... De... Ah, oui. Question. Euh, je fais cette présentation en anglais, hein, normalement. Comme vous voulez. I'm going to do it in English because there are some English speakers that will not uh, be able to participate if I do it in French. <laughs> so, uh, together with us to discuss about interoperability in the cloud, we have uh, Alexandre Lefebvre from AWD2. Alexandre is a uh, 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 polytechnician. Uh, And he's followed that by being a PhD on the recursive aggregate deductive database. He's CTO of OW2 and co lead of the OW2 Open Source Cloud War Initiative, as well as Open Cloud's coordinator at Orange Labs. We also have uh, Boris Soche from Bull. Bull uh, has a long time implication in the open source market, uh, in the SS2L and various community. He is founder of NovaForge.org. Open Source Software Site, and the OpenCIO Summit. Within Bull, he is heading the strategy and marketing for the business integration solutions. We also have Craig Kiedemann from Microsoft. Craig Kiedemann is a senior technical ambassador in the interoperability strategy team at Microsoft, focused on PHP, Java, and open cloud technologies. We also have uh, Emmanuel Bernard from Red Hat. Emmanuel uh, is data platform architect at JBoss by Red Hat and member of the Hibernate team. He has founded and leads the Hibernate Search, Hibernate Validator, and the newcomer Hibernate OGM. I believe you're doing a presentation on OGM tomorrow. Um, Emmanuel is a member of GPA 2.0 expert group and the spec lead of Bean Validation. We also have uh, Jamie, uh, Jan James Marshall, his real full name, <laughs> from Prologue. Uh, he's the expertise manager at Prologue. He's responsible for the short, middle, and long products research and development and creator of the business application languages Able, Able++, and Sing. He works in conjunction with the Institute Telecom uh, Paris in standardization activity within ISO, IEC, and a lot of other symbols that I'm going to spare for now, you can read it on the website, uh, concerning uh, collaboration technologies. James Duncan from Joyant. Hi, James. Uh, he's a VP uh, of open source at Joyant. James is a forward-thinking, business-focused technologist with both deep understanding of the web and a broad knowledge of protocols. Sam Johnson from the Open Cloud uh, Initiative. Sam is the president of this initiative. Uh, it, it is a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting the use of open certain in the cloud computing product and services. Uh, Sam is also currently the director of cloud and IT services at Equinix in, in Europe. Previously, he was working for Google, where he was managing the global tech program. And last but not least, Didier Souchère from Neo Telecom. Uh, since January 2003, Didier Souchere has led the growth of Neo Telecom on the operator's market. Ranked number two operator, uh, IP operator in France, uh, Didier has moved the company into cloud computing since 2008. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us on this uh, roundtable on interoperability. And I'm not going to do an introduction. I, I really want to have you speak, not me. Um, so my, my question right now is, we had a similar roundtable a year ago. You may not have been uh, here. Uh, however, I'd like to understand from uh, each of you's point of view, what has changed in terms of interoperability in the cloud in the past year? Um, well, one, I, I think 
anecdote that uh, happened was uh, Amazon had a, had a big, big uh, EC2 failure on the East Coast, and I think that pushed back interoperability way up the the stack of priority for for many people. Uh, that's that was one of the events I think that you know uh, pushed that. Um, we've also seen many uh, new standout pushing up, uh, new or existing one trying trying to uh, to push up, and I'd like to say also. Um, not so much on the infrastructure side of it, but the past um, 2000, mid 2010, 2011 has been a big year, I think, for past like with offering coming up or being announced at least. Um, so that that's my uh, what's up um, summary, I would say. You say that there's been some standards that have come through this year. I'd say that there's been some <coughs> sorry some specifications which have been released. I would uh, contend that there aren't any standards as yet. Ah, fair point. <laughs> Just to clarify. Anybody else has a di different uh, point of view on, uh, on this subject? So, f possibly counter, um, I actually don't think much has changed. Um, in general, you know, we still don't have clouds that interoperate. We don't have um, any specifications that are implemented and shared and, and agreed upon. And, and the, there's you know, a, a number of reasons for that, but the, the big key d is despite the, the likes of Amazon having a significant outage, we haven't really seen a great deal of customer demand for it. Um, and that remains as true today as it was a year ago. I, well, I would again, again counter that by saying there are clouds that interoperate, but uh, provided you use exactly the same version of exactly the same software from exactly the same vendor, and uh, you know, I don't need to give examples of, of the, the past where this hasn't worked very well for us. On the company side, uh, for professional customers, we have seen more and more requests from our customers moving to private cloud instead of uh, public cloud because uh, uh, information system of the companies are strategic and uh, company, even they move to cloud computing that is much more acceptable today than it was two days ago, uh, really need to have some kind of control of those infrastructure. Well, I wasn't present at the last meeting, but uh, I would say that it's clear that bare metal has its part to play in the cloud offerings because not everything can be virtualized and maintain its performance. And you mentioned before that there has been a lot happening on the pass offerings, and it's true that there is some level of interoperability where w really there is some level of multi-language support and multi-infrastructure support, uh, which is a kind of openness, but I wouldn't say that it's really interoperable, interoperable at the moment, whereas it's, it, it is more open than it was. Uh, one reason could be the lack of standards. I mean, the specifications are just coming out. So uh, the, the, the multi-support is based on the products mainly at the moment, not really on the specifications. And, but it's not interoperable, I agree with you. It's more of an opening, I would say. Yeah, I agree with that. On the, on the past side, there used to be just you know, two guys and a dog basically on the market. And um, the coming up of big, uh, uh, big players actually will push towards the inter interoperability and standardization at which level? That's a good question. But uh. Yeah, I also wasn't here last year, unfortunately. But when I look at a lot of the cloud offerings out there, um, I mean, the good news is that the, the APIs on which all the services are based are typically based at least on uh, widely accepted industry standards like HTTP and REST. So even though some of the higher order, more semantic types of standards haven't been fleshed out um, you know, by the international standards community, at least we have um, a common understanding of types of protocols we can use to build composite applications that can take advantage of services from multiple providers today. But the question was difference between last year and, and this year. What, what, what is, yeah, what, what has difference? been happening? I think that last year we, have, uh, we, we had ideas, you know, uh, and now we had perceptions, and now we have customers, uh, we have deployments, and then perhaps uh, last year that was nearly perception, and now it's really a reality what we have. And then it's the, for, on my point, it's uh, the, the main difference. The main difference was that we, we went from ideas to real deployment within customers. And then uh, we have uh, true issues now, not to say problems sometimes. So 
if I hear you correctly, the idea of uh, having cloud federations is not yet there. Do you think like uh, open projects uh, have helped uh, getting towards this direction or maybe other projects? Um, cloud federation is something that looks very nice on the paper. So. Cloud federation is clearly the aim of the Compatible One project. And so we're working actively towards that. Um, I would counter the fact that we are actually implementing these specifications with an aim to making them become standards too. Yeah, I think it, it depends as well what you mean by cloud federation. I think a, 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 an important thing that people ask for is to be able to run a cloud at multiple sites. And we are seeing people deploying infrastructure at multiple sites and setting up a backbone. Um, when you talk about cloud federation in terms of having multiple, uh, and it's all about trust, uh, di different um, uh, administrative units looking after different components of it, you now start to talk about something like federated identity. And uh, as you've seen, for various reasons, that hasn't really worked very well. So it's, uh, I'm not sure whether it's necessarily a, a necessary goal. So if we have, for example, uh, you know, you want to move something from cloud A to cloud B, you will use some kind of management tool that will migrate the workload without either of those clouds necessarily having to trust each other, but still having to understand the language that they're speaking. So the tool has to speak the, the, the interfaces and both of them have to speak the interchange formats, basically. So if I link that back to the previous panel, uh, people were mentioning tools like that as brokers. Is that what you're talking about? Oh, no, I don't, I don't want to go near the broker discussion. <laughs> the, there was a, a, a NIST definition that came out about the, the term broker that had a number of different subcomponents that was surprisingly contentious for what is actually a fairly boring term. Um, a broker, for me, is somebody that sells something like an insurance broker. And I just, I, I, my, my personal belief is that there's not really much room. Like, if you look, a lot of cloud is modelled after the electricity industry. So we look, we've got the internet, that's like the grid. If you look at how the electricity industry works, you, you, they, they buy it wholesale and then sell it retail uh, via the grid. Um, and there's a margin in there and there's, there's, you know, there's a possibility to make money there. But I don't think that that's really a necessary component uh, for, for cloud. We may see cloud brokers, but I don't think it's critical. Let's, I think you, your idea was more about uh, more like a kind of a cloud manager where you are in control of everything and moving some stuff from one cloud provider to another. And in this space, uh, things are coming. I mean, you know, various player, player including us, are ramping up stuff in, in this area. Uh, but it's still very young. So uh, there is no like ready tool, um, at least at the level that the customer is willing, willing to get uh, his hand on um, at the moment. So this whole notion of client, uh, uh, sorry, cloud manager, cloud broker um, is here up in the air, but I, I don't see it there, at least today. Yeah, yeah I don't see it there too. Uh, no, no broker really, but uh, to illustrate uh, the idea, we are recently entered in negotiations with uh, customers that are working for the media industry. I mean companies providing uh, 3D content or stuff like this. Those guys use a lot of servers for rendering for any kind of uh, computation and so on. They need also a huge volume of storage. To give you uh, an example, one film is about uh, 200, 220 uh, terabytes today. And those guys have internal platforms for their people to work on, but they need uh, from time to time to address additional capacity of storage, additional servers, additional uh, rendering capacity. They just want to take control over an external platform in, uh, by deploying their own application on it and managing uh, the whole platform as it was their own. So you're, you're talking here about bursting capabilities. Of exactly. Today, today we have clearly this kind of request, at least for the media industry. And, and there is solution for it? Yeah, of course, because uh, those guys uh, already uh, have, let's say, a kernel platform in their own, and they just want to purchase as needed additional capacity. So uh, they, of course, need a very good uh, connectivity, meaning uh, the building is connected to a fiber network, and they're able to have a direct connection to the different places 
I mean data centers, where uh, they can find this capacity and have a provider able to uh, uh, provide server storage or anything just on demand with uh, paper use. Any other examples? Well, I sort of wanted to, again, slightly contrary. Um, if you think about what's actually going on in the cloud, um, the idea of sort of having a broker to move workloads around is, is, it sounds very attractive on the surface, but there's a fundamental reality which it fails to deal with, and that's the fact that data is very, very sticky to location at the moment. We're not past that point where we can just move the data as easily as the application. If, if, if moving an application was hard, we would all switch data centers in a traditional bare metal mo model all the time, and the cloud actually wouldn't be very important. Um, it's the fact that moving data around it that is very hard that makes the cloud a viable prospect to begin with. And so until we solve that problem, I think you know, the, the notion of having this big broker in the sky shifting our workloads to the most efficient resource is slightly, is slightly misleading. Can we get back to what broker really means? <laughs> okay. Please do. Broker Here is not just selling. To be able to sell, you have to buy, unless, of course, you steal. Well, that's so, half the problem, is the money side of it. Okay. So the broker, obviously, is selling that which he has purchased and he has negotiated. Now, brokering is an integral part of commerce and business. And cloud is an integral part of modern business and commerce. So consequently, cloud brokering will be necessary. However, brokering is not moving machines between platforms. It's negotiating contracts on platforms. We should really call the platform movers managers. Just to go back to our use cases, uh, Rafael Ferreira, who was on the previous panel, uh, well, I, I, I'll do a bad job by describing his use case, but basically he's got customers who have a mix of public cloud, private cloud, and that need bursting as well. So that's one application that runs on multiple cloud. Uh, and it's it's one application that needs several technology for uh, for business reasons because they have some private data in their private cloud. They have some, uh, say, temporary data for the application that fits well in a public cloud, and they need to mix both. So in that case, they do need some interoperability to make the whole thing from the uh, developer and from the application point of view look like one application that is deployed on several technologies. So that's just one example of a use case that that they have today. The problem that I, I have, though, with, with the, the term cloud bursting is that you get this idea that, okay, my data center's full, so now I'm just going to go to Amazon and start spinning stuff up out there. It, applications typically don't really work like that because there's databases involved, there's uh, networking, there's DNS, all this stuff. Now, one of the things that we did at Equinix recently was we announced a product uh, with Amazon called Direct Connect, where you can actually deploy into some of our facilities and connect directly into Amazon's cloud. And then the type of application that I see being deployed using this uh, is, is one where, you know, for example, you might go out to Amazon to do MapReduce, or you might go out there to do, um, if you're a telco, you might do a monthly billing process or something. I don't think you'll have an application like SharePoint, for example, that spans you know, data center technology and then spins up a bunch of Amazon instances at 9 o'clock in the morning when it's, when it's busy. Well, you know, I think that uh, the, um, I, I see I see some value in the brokerage, uh, as you as you say, really, because you know I think that if, if you take um, your example of uh, insurance contract, if you have ten contracts to choose, I don't know if you're the best, uh, you know, the best positioned to to choose that contract. But perhaps you can have somebody or something that can help you negotiating the contracts with the company. So I see some value in the, in the broker and in the brokerage. Secondly, I, see, I think that if we, if we say that um, if we don't move the data, it means that, in fact, you're stuck, and you're stuck on the cloud. Um, I don't think it's the best way to convince customers that they have to move on the cloud. If, you see, if, you, if we say to them, well, you know, uh, well, you're going to be stuck on, on, on that cloud. And then it, when, when, I, when I understand, if I understand quite well what you said, it's the same that we had, you know, uh, years ago on, on servers, and that we say, well, you know, before the clusters, the problem is the data, where are the data, because if we have two servers, it will be uh, big problems and so on. And then at that time, we had the middleware. 
in my company, we were very strong in middleware. So that was the, the way of making servers working together and networks working together and so on. And perhaps the next step will be the cloudware. It's what uh, RW2 is doing and we're working on with compatible one and so on. But perhaps it's, uh, it will be the solution if we can imagine something that help cloud working together like we are making servers working together without any issue of data. Even if the data moving is a problem, that I think that we can find solutions in you know, uh, addressing this issue. Well, the biggest, the biggest challenge, the, the, the term ec econom um, economists call it fungibility. And the, the biggest problem is that the VMs are actually quite large. They can run to tens or hundreds of gigabytes. So if you can get the size of the workload to be smaller, then, and if you can distribute it using, for example, rather than a relational database, a non-relational database like Cassandra or something like this, you can actually get a little bit more of a fluid workload. And if you look at how chips like the, uh, the, like the, um, the cell processors in, in the PlayStation 3 work, they have things called appulets, which are a small chunk of code and data. And you know, that, that's kind of the, the unit of work in a PlayStation 3. Now, maybe you can conceive of a time where you could have a workload literally being fluid between cloud providers. But uh, I think we're a ways away from that. Well, there are many ways to try and, you know, I mean, not avoid this problem, but limit this problem. One way could be to say, you know what, my, I'm going to have some customer here, some customer there. So, yes, if this cloud provider goes down, uh, you know, a tenth of my customer will go down, but the rest won't be on my back. Uh, that would be one way. Of course, it's not 100% uptime for everyone, uh, but that, that would be one way. Another one would be to, I guess, if you got enough money, to try and proactively try and sync um, asynchronously or, I mean, near real time data from one, you know, one cloud to another. Um, I agree with you, the middleware um, has had those kind of technology, at least on a on a LAN uh, for, for, for some time, so we, we could try and expand this kind of technology. There will be, due to the Latin, fundamental latency that we have today, yeah, there will be um, trade-offs on, you know, you will lose probably some of the data, one second, two seconds, five seconds, I don't know, of data, but still it might be better to lose five seconds of data instead of like, I don't know, two weeks of, you know, getting back your stuff up one way or another. And in Going back to uh, my initial idea, the, um, that's where a, a kind of a cloud manager trying to um, not fully automatize everything like that, but at least all the kind of um, you know Taylorism part of your work, moving stuff from one one place to another, will uh, will help. I think some of it is um, how we think about this stuff as well. I mean, we can take it from a, a VM perspective, which Sam's absolutely right. Moving a VM from one place to another involves a large chunk of work. The good news here is that, um, is that a v moving a VM is rarely necessary. Um, you know, a effectively, a VM is an operating system plus some application data. And the application data is actually the thing that is, is unique or, or not common, more to the point. Um, and so if we, if we m perhaps take a step back from the idea of moving VMs around and instead think about just different deployment scenarios, um, we, we come back to how does change management happen in a traditional data center? How do developers move their applications from a development environment to a staging environment to a production environment? That's perhaps a more valid question. And if you look at the, the APIs that, for example, Amazon provide or Rackspace or, or Joyent or any of the other cloud vendors, if they were truly difficult to use, and, and complex and represented a barrier <coughs> of entry, you wouldn't have seen the take up in the cloud that has been seen. And so the interoperative, interop between these clouds is somewhat of a unicorn as well. Yeah, the only, the only thing I wanted to add was when you look at um, the vendors who have pass offerings uh, in the market, it seems to me that it's the responsibility of that vendor to handle a lot of the, the different issues associated with this whole brokerage idea. I mean, I don't think it's, I don't think we can put the responsibility of our business customers to go have to find a broker who they trust. Um, I don't know, you know, what mortgage brokers are like in any other country, but in the U.S., you know, 
there's some shady ones out there and you got to find a broker that you can trust. You got to understand what the cost structure is. You got to understand what the SLA structure is. So the alternative would be to put the, um, put the onus on the provider of pass to make sure you have geo redundancy, synchronized data, and all of those different capabilities that you might get from some third party, potentially trustworthy broker, but, but demand that as part of your pass offering. Yeah, I agree that somehow the whole notion of cloud management and the brokering and so on is um, much more relevant for uh, at the ES level than at the pass level where, and it's probably potentially two different kind of clients. One would say, oh, I want this uh, you know, short time application, get it up and running very quickly, put it out there and, uh, and be done with it. And this pass provider you know, guaranteed me a few things. Whereas at the ES level, you really are kind of in between this traditional IT management where you handle everything from top to bottom. Uh, here, you, the hardware, it kind of goes out of the way, but you still have to manage um, a bunch of the, okay, let's decide which VM I, I want, which uh, version of the software I want, and so on and so on. So pass kind of eliminate, is it good or not? That's a good question, but kind of eliminate that and say, we handle that for you. Will you trust your past provider? That's another question. So uh, I'm hearing um, the question of um, interoperability being addressed at the ES level and at the SAS le uh, at the PASS level, but I'm not hearing anything about the SAS level. Um, is it just out of the game? So one of the things is that the infrastructure layer um, to get back to one of the age-old cloud definition discussions, I would, if you, if you want to, it's kind of like the food pyramid but upside down. Infrastructure is a very, very small, um, very simple compute storage networking problem. You go to pass and you've got databases, queues, run times, payment gateways and all this other rubbish in there. But then when you go to SaaS, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it all, it's everything. It's, you know, it's... it's CRM to mail to, you know, you name it. So it depends on what specifically you're focusing on. Um, yeah. When you go up to the SaaS level, you're talking about business processes. Right. And they're described using EDI. Okay? That's going to be government managed. It's going to be invoicing systems. It's going to be payroll. These are the kind of things they're specified in legislation. So interoperability is legislative. So there is a law that defines the interoperability of SaaS. That's, that's what I'm hearing? The, the, no, the, SaaS is just an application. Exactly. And it's the data that is exchanged that's important. And that's why open data is important. And, uh, and like any system, you have a basic foundation. And the foundation is the pipes, the hardware, the virtualization. Then on top of that, you can define PaaS or SaaS or anything else. But if you need uh, at least the basic level of interoperability, it will be at the network or uh, uh, VM level. Yeah, but from uh, the, the customer point of view, if I am about to choose a SaaS application, is there things that I need to check to, to make sure that uh, there will be some kind of interoperability with another provider later on? It's, uh, if I can I try a loose analogy, uh, you know, uh, yes level is kind of underwear. You can switch from one to another very easily. SaaS level is almost like a wife. Switching from one to another is possible, but it's a long process. And it's very much like that. If you look at, I don't know, let's say I have my, uh, I'm using SAP for, <laughs> okay, sorry. but <laughs> I'm using SAP for, um, you know, everything financial. Switching this application to another required transferring all the data to this new, uh, provider I'm going to use, and then start using in, uh, using it, uh, my, uh, doing from uh, training for my my crew from this old application to the new application. I don't really believe uh, in. Um, I mean, unless for very simple services like weather services or whatever, there is no real easy way to say, oh, I'm able to switch from SAP to something else just uh, without the user knowing it, without me having to worry about that. To go uh, one step further there. Even, Are you um, trying that? I, no, I, I totally agree with what you're saying, I, but I think it goes even further than that. Um, when you're dealing with those sort of applications, you're dealing at a level far beyond you know, just having the data in, in which application. Applications at that sort of level of business are transformative of business. They have an impact on your processes. And you know, no company is realistically going to switch from, as you say, you know, 
Oracle to SAP overnight. That's not what happens. You model the company in the application. Or, as usually happens, the other way around. I think the issue is not to move to move for SAP, for instance, if we stay to SAP, from a cloud to another cloud. I think that the issue is how to use a CRM that is not SAP CRM on a cloud, and then using SAP as an ERP on another cloud. On another cloud. And interoperability, it's that. Interoperability between applications within applications, it's not to move from a server to another server. It's how to make two servers working together. It's the same for the cloud. And it's where I think the broker has a, uh, you know, has a value. Then we can choose a cloud using, you know, without knowing any, anything on the, on the technology and so on. Customers, it's not their problems. They don't have to choose. They don't have to be uh, that good on the technology used on, on, on the cloud. Perhaps there is an issue on the data, but if you use CRM on a part and then the RP on the other part to on two different clouds, then it's interoperability, and I think it should be possible. Uh, there is a, a further layer, which is the business process as a service, which itself should be completely interoperable. So, so the business process of a company is well defined and should be transformable to another business process as a service offerer. I, I think it's unicorn thinking, <laughs> I don't know, I, I, I won't even try to argue, but it's kind of a belief at this stage, but um, yeah, I don't see the ability of, you know, companies to automatize and processize so much their business that they could achieve the level of um, specification and switching that you're talking about. Well, I think that SaaS in, interoperability or whatever we mean behind it, uh, it's, uh, if you've got several issues, you've got the migration from one proprietary system that does an, I don't know, ERP function to another one, which has got nothing to do with cloud and it has to do with the fact that they are intrinsically not meant to be interoperable, these two, these two uh, proprietary products. In some cases, you would find some uh, products that are interoperable because there are some Private, uh, private schemas or there are some normalized or standardized, uh, I don't know, XML descriptions in which you could easily extract the data and move from one to the other. But otherwise, the, the problem's got nothing to do with cloud. It's just, as we said before, is it's got to do with the fact that are these applications meant to interoperate, to interoperate or not? And if they're not, then there's just not a question. That's the, same, that's the same problem we have with traditional application as deployed today. So. Do I have a module to interoperate A with B? Yes or no? And then I go for it. Of course, the rest, HTTP and so on, have somewhat simplified the game in this area. But I, I wouldn't see it as SaaS interoperability uh, question. Well, if we, if we go back as well just to, to you know, what, what cloud is, is effectively moving from a product to a service. So whether it's a product that talks a certain format or a service that talks a certain format, it's, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. Um, and if you look at, 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 our, at the research we did for the Open Cloud Initiative, we basically found that, uh, that there's two things that you need to have, one of which is they both need to speak the same language, they both need to have the same programmatic interfaces, because there's no point, you know, one cloud can keep the data in the most transparent format you like if you can't access the cloud programmatically. If there's no APIs, it's useless. And the other thing is that you, that you then need to have um, a format that both the clouds understand. So if you look at a product like an online word processor, if they, if they had a, a, an open protocol like AtomPub and the, um, the, the body of the messages was, uh, was uh, an open format like ODF, then for the sake of you know, what we, what we uh, discovered, that would be um, adequate for open cloud. And then you can move from one cloud to another. Um, but I really think that the, the place that we need to focus a lot of our energy now is on the components behind the cloud. I think a lot of the work in the SaaS layer is already done. I think the infrastructure layer was largely a distraction. The, the operating system is effectively a cancer. It sits there and just wants to be configured and patched. It increases the attack surface and is not very interesting. So if we can focus more on the platform side of things, which has is, which is started to be, that's the big shift this year, is that we're a lot more talking about platforms. And I think that that's a, you know, that's a really good thing. I think we're, we're even talking about platforms without, without realizing perhaps that we're talking about platforms. 
For example, we tend to think of Amazon Web Services as you know, primarily compute, storage, and network, but really it isn't. It's much deeper than that, and it's providing a platform without you knowing it's, it's providing a platform. Exactly. Um, and so when you start to use, for example, the simple queue service when you're inside Amazon, you are binding yourself to Amazon in a non-interoperable way. Um, and that's, uh, that's at the pass level. Whether we want to call it that or not, or whether it's advertised as that or not, that's where it is. So is there a solution to avoid this binding? Uh, should people use certain type of software rather than others? I think the simplest thing to do is to get as close to HTTP as you can. And uh, you know, don't, because otherwise you end up, you build an application, you'll end up with you know, 38 different formats that you've got to talk, JSON and BSON and XML and all this other rubbish. Um, you know, for each different component. One thing for databases, another thing for payment gateways, something else for queues. You know, I think if we try and talk at least the common language and, and the language of the internet, then that's, that's will be a long way uh, towards being there. So that's one way. Um, another way is to see it as, today I'm <laughs> writing my application in Ruby on Rails or Java EE or, you know, PHP, whatever, I don't know, Symfony or whatever, and consider those APIs are kind of the common language you're trying to adhere to, so that if you have a pass provider, uh, two pass providers offering Java E compatibility, uh, you will be able to somewhat more easily switch from one to, um, to another. Uh, and, and it's much easier to try and do that at the API level, because at least there is some kind of specification there is the actual physical API you use, as opposed to using the, I don't know, simple DB Amazon API, where unless your other provider provides some kind of um, um, bridge between the, the, the Amazon API and down to its own proprietary solution API, you will have to rewrite that part of your application, which can be quite, quite expensive. Yeah, at, at the Java E level, uh, there's one thing to be able to have multiple pass providers to take your EAR application and deploy it and run it on one node, but then there's a there's a whole stack of it because applications are not usually running on one VM. There are distributed applications which have constraints of clustering, which have constraints of high availability, which have SLA constraints, and and I don't think that we're here yet at the platform level so that all these platform providers provide you with the same capabilities of being able to express in, from the application developer point of view the fact that I have here two nodes that are for high availability, therefore I want them to be on two separate physical nodes, and or uh, I want to be able to tell my platform provider that this node handles customer data and due to my Polish law it has to be on a Polish node. Things like that you don't find yet in the standards, uh, and hopefully this will come. I agree that there has been some progress on the platform as a service, and you'd find several platform providers that give you the ability to execute one Java E node, but all the rest that makes an application a real distributed application is not there yet. Well, I think another, another part of that as well is if you've got two providers who are claiming to have you know, support Java, it's not necessarily the same thing at all. If you look at the, uh, the modifications that were made um, in order to support the language for Google App Engine, you know, it's not Java as you would know it. You can't just take an application and poke it into App Engine and hope it'll run. And the, the, the changes were made with good technical reason in order to support scalability. You know, you don't want these guys and, and multi-tenancy securely. You don't want people being able to write to the local disks. So you have to basically go and trim off a lot of the kind of roots that would that would attach an application to a server. Yeah, well, writing to this is kind of a, well, yes, it's impossible in Google App Engine and most, most platforms, it's kind of a red herring. I, I, uh, even at Google App Engine level, there is some APIs that are uh, the Java API, some that look like the Java API, and some that are completely different. And that's where the real threat is, because once you're stuck and use that in your application, uh, you, got, you got to stay. Right. And you... when they change the pricing model, which was, uh, well, about to happen, and people try and realize the old price and the, the new price, well, it hurts. <laughs> well, once you want to save data, for example, you have to save it in Bigtable. And then if you're building something on Amazon, you know, their approach is, uh, is simple DB, and they're similar, but sufficiently different that they're not interoperable. And I don't think that there'll be like Especially a simple at the performance ODBC. level. I hate to interrupt, to interrupt you because the discussion was very interesting, but we only have three minutes left. And I'd like to uh, ask each one of you to give, if you can, um, the one or two things that your organization is going to be doing in the next year 
to improve interoperability. Starting at this end, then. Sure. Okay. So at the uh, at the Open Cloud Initiative, we've um, we've had a, a, a public comment period on the Open Cloud principles. We're following uh, the Open Source Initiatives model of uh, creating a document which describes what Open Cloud means, and then having a certification program around that, all community consensus based. So what we're going to do is to uh, is to is to lock down this definition, advertise it, and get people to start uh, start using it. Um, so that when we talk about open cloud, we're all talking about the same thing. Well, I mean, joint is largely just infrastructure. That's what we provide. And so, you know, you can treat us like you would treat a bare metal data center to a large extent. That's not to say we're not interested in all the discussions that are going on or that we, we're sort of acting blindly. Um, we just haven't seen anything emerge yet. The good news here is that, you know, the internet has a long and noble history of winning. Um, and so interoperability, I think, will come about, but it's just a matter of the, the cream rising to the top. OK, uh, at our level, we are focusing on infrastructure. But the idea now is, uh, is definitely each time we set up a new location, each time we open a new data center, each time we set up a new cloud platform. Uh, at the basic level uh, of infrastructure, and this platform is uh, intended to host uh, the different uh, pass uh, solutions and different virtualization products. It can be uh, separated in diverse uh, clouds, and uh, our goal is definitely to offer uh, the customers or the developers the possibility to host in one place, to replicate in another one, and at the infrastructure level or the past level. At Prolog, we've been working since 1978 for interoperability, multi-tenancy, multi-users, and portability. This experience, we should be bringing it to Compatible One and future national projects to ensure interoperability above the clouds. Um, so at Red Hat, we do uh, probably many things either directly to address this problem or indirect directly. So let me mention just a few of them. Well, first of all, we do everything in open source. Uh, um, so you know that's one step, not very, not directly addressing that, but uh, it's an important step. Um, the second one is we partic what participate in Delta Cloud, Apache Delta Cloud, which is. Uh, one effort to specify and standardize, uh, I, I guess, abstract the way you interact with your um, uh, the management of your virtual machine between Amazon and other cloud providers. Um, more generally speaking, on the yes and application level, we have uh, something called uh, cloud forms, which um, basically address cloud management, the idea of being able to move one workload from one area to another, deciding which uh, you know, uh, provider is more expensive than another and, and switching accordingly, but also under the life cycle of your application. Oh, this application is needing one, two, three more nodes, depending on the uh, architecture as a code, as you were describing it. Uh, so we're trying to address that as well. And at the past level, we have uh, a project named OpenShift, product named OpenShift. Uh, which we're trying to make you be able to deploy your traditional application, your Java application, into OpenShift, and that it works. So it's a big challenge, but that's the target. Yeah, at OW2, we have a thing called the Open Source Cloudware Initiative, and we are trying to make that as a platform where a number of collaborative R&D projects uh, would exchange with each other and we try to make sure that everybody's aware of the standards and the specifications that come out and share their knowledge about those standards, those specifications, and try to implement them and interoperate with each other. And on with my other Orange Lab hats, uh, we're participating in, one of, in, in at least one of those collaborative research projects to uh, mainly target the platform as a service level in open source. So at Microsoft, we're spending a lot of time, um, particularly on our, our platform as a service offering, Windows Azure, thinking about how to really um, 
really deliver openness. And that, in, in our mind, that's about making sure that we're always implementing things using open standards, open protocols, uh, giving developers choice uh, to be, bring their language and runtime of choice and, and really give that flexibility. Um, we're also continually looking to um, partner with others in the industry. Um, I look forward to talking with many of you after the panel to understand what are the prevailing notions of openness in the cloud and what does that mean and what can Microsoft do to be a more um, cooperative citizen in, in that space. On our side, we, we are developing applications and running these applications on the cloud or not on the cloud. I don't think that the best way for uh, you know to inter interoperate between these applications it's uh, to, to ask the, the cloud makers or the cloud provider to make it for us. So we'll keep on, uh, we, we had the same issue when we, are, when we were selling servers and just servers. And then we, we, we went to uh, Object Web, then it, we went to RW2, and now we are still investing in RW2 in the Cloudware initiative. And I think it's the best place for us to put our money to make everything we are developing interoperate, interoperate between different clouds. And um, things like that uh, brings value to us. Thank you very much, everyone. I think that was a very interesting roundtable, and that was because of you. Um, just to mention, the cloud track continues uh, tomorrow, starting at 9 with a keynote here. Uh, there is a, a series of sessions in the Bruxelles room uh, from 9.30 until 3 p.m. Uh, lots of case studies, people uh, explaining how they've used cloud, how they've deployed it. So if you're interested in cloud, that continues. And Saturday, there will be some hands-on training. Thank you very much. Merci, Nicolas. Merci à vous tous.